Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. Today we are going to be starting a whole pile of seeds. Now for most of you, these are seeds that are typical for you to grow in your spring garden. Here in San Diego, spring is kind of a blend of winter into spring. So for me, this is what I'm growing now. I like to consider it the start of my spring garden. Now, in case you're wondering what I have in my hand here, it's actually a cup of calendula flower from the garden, as well as a couple sprigs of thyme and some honey. That is because I just recovered from being sick. So a little old friend of ours once told us that thyme is really good for respiratory health, and that's what I'm sipping on today. So let's get right into it with some seed starting. I have a couple of different things to show you guys today. I'm going to be covering some of the strategies and techniques to getting some of these seeds to grow well, and also my strategies for succession planting and also companion planting throughout this whole entire time. Now we're going to start it off with something very simple here which is a staple and hopefully most of your gardens, especially if you like eating lots of broccoli. This is the Checo broccoli. This is a wonderful broccoli that produces a standard head. So like the standard crown that you might get at the grocery store. But the nice thing about this one, and actually this is true for just about any crowning broccoli, is that it produces an abundance of side shoots. Now those side shoots, in my opinion, are the real prize. They're not gonna be that giant head of broccoli that you put on the table, but they are really tender and they grow very prolifically and they're very easy to harvest for even like a quick thing to throw in your bowl of ramen if you want a quick lunch or just for a quick saute, dinner, lunch, whatever you want to do. Springtime can be a very volatile time of year where you're vacillating between cold temperatures, warm temperatures. And here in San Diego, we've had years where actually our hottest day of the year was in spring. So I want to make sure that I don't cover things that only like the cold weather. Those are the things I grow in the fall through the winter like everything I have behind me now, tons of cabbages, tons of broccolis, things like that. Now the next one I'm going to be putting in is the Tokyo Long White Onion. This is just a standard green onion. And for this one, instead of seeding it as I did the broccoli, all I'm going to do is actually just sprinkle a whole bunch of seeds right on top of the cells here. You could be very, very generous with onions. You could plant densely, especially something like a green onion. They're very easy to separate out later, so it's not really a big deal. Now we're gonna follow that up with another broccoli, but this is broccolini. In this case, it's a variety called Melody, which I picked up from Johnny's. For me personally, broccolini is where it's at. I love trying it up either in the oven, a pizza oven, in the pan. It's just so wonderful. I find that it's sweeter. The stems are generally always more tender, and you still get that nice little fl florette on top. So for me, if I had to choose only one, I would grow broccolini any day of the week over a standard broccoli. When it comes to the best tasting cauliflowers, my favorite is the orange or cheddar style cauliflowers. Currently we don't carry one at Botanical Interests, but I did pick this one up again from Johnny's. It's called Clementine. This is one that the seed is expensive. You only get 25 seeds in this packet. I don't remember the cost of it, but it's more than your typical packet. But I gotta say, for whatever reason, those orange style cauliflowers just taste so good. Now here's a new one for me. This one is Gershwin. Again, I think this is a more expensive seed from Johnny's, but this is a cucumber that I'm planning on putting in the greenhouse, which is what I'm standing next to over here. You might even see that there's a couple strawberries over here that are almost ripe. So these cucumbers, just to test, I'm gonna put them in there. Now I do have some flowers here. This is the Amazing Gray Poppy. This one's from uh, Florette. Now you may know Florette, she has a TV show on Magnolia where she's uh, showing all these wonderful flowers. She develops her own cultivars, she sells seed, and I love supporting other people who create content around gardening. So I had to pick up some of her seeds here. Now, the trick with poppies is that when you sow them, you don't wanna bury them in soil. Now, a lot of people say that you can't transplant poppies. I've transplanted poppies my whole life. It always seems to work well for me. It's just a matter of being patient and doing it before the roots get too big inside the container that you're growing them in. So the seeds are really tiny. And like I said, you don't wanna bury them. And the reason for that is that they need light to germinate. So all I'm doing here is I'm going to be tapping the back of my hand. I could see these tiny little seeds. They're smaller than just about anything that I usually sow. All I'm going to do now is just press them into the surface very gently with my thumb. All that's doing is making sure that the seed is pressed into the soil so that it can get that soil moisture contact that helps it germinate, but I am not burying it. If I bury it too deep, it won't get any light and it will not germinate whatsoever. Now this one here is a new one to me last year, and it was absolutely my, by far my favorite flower that I've added to my garden. In this case, it's called Bee's Friend, but it's actually a Felicia, I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a 
P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A. -E it's also a blue flower and blue flowers tend to attract bees. And that's why it's called Bees Friend. Cause let me tell you guys, this thing was covered in bees for a very long time throughout the season because of that really wonderful long bloom time. I can't imagine not growing this. It's so cool looking. It's so wonderful for the pollinators. And it's also a really nice color. I love the texture it adds with that kind of unfurling frond-like flower head. So if you guys haven't tried it before, check it out. It's really wonderful. It's also a native pollinator in a lot of different areas. So another great reason to have it. Here we have Vivian lettuce. This is one that I started growing last year. It's done quite well for me. This and Little Gem are now my standard kind of romaine lettuces that I go to. And what you're seeing here, something you might have not seen before. This is a 16 cell. So just like the six cells here, it is made by us, American Trade Company for Epic Gardening. And the cool thing about this one is that there's 16 cells right there. So I actually have been testing them out for a bit now. Right here I have golden beets. Yes, you can transplant beets. I actually prefer to transplant them. Now the deal with these is that you want to loosen them up because there's a lot of plants in here. So what I like to do is give them a nice little tap like so. And then all you have to do is pull up on the seedling. It should come right up with the nice little soil ball just like that. So it has all the same benefits of the pruning in the sense that there's an open bottom and it has the channels that direct the roots downwards. So right here, this is a perfect beet transplant to put in the ground. Now you might be wondering, why would I use this? Well, one of the reasons you might wanna use this is if you're growing a lot of a single thing. That is why I brought it out for the lettuce. If I'm growing lettuce, I'm not just growing six heads of lettuce. I'm probably going to plant 16 so I could have a nice salad to harvest throughout multiple time periods instead of just having six heads of lettuce that are then gone. For me, I like having more rather than trying to succession sow. I find it easier to manage that way. So these 16 cells are really wonderful for that reason. The other thing that's really great for is saving you on some soil. These take up a lot less soil than something like this. And a lot of plants, as long as you transplant them early enough, like these beets might be a little bit too big for that container now, but honestly, they still look healthy, is that you could use less soil and transplant earlier. So instead of leaving them in these bigger cells that use more soil, you could go ahead and do a lot of things in these smaller ones and just get them in the garden as soon as they start growing. Now, obviously for something like this, I wouldn't recommend it for long-term transplants. Like if you were to grow tomatoes in these, that's totally fine. But as soon as they germinate, you'd want to pot them up. Um, things that have bigger seeds like beans or squash, probably not ideal in this because the seed is quite close to the size of the volume here. So for things like lettuce, things like beets, anything that you want a lot of or things that you want to just get in the ground as soon as it germinates, this is your friend because it's going to save you a whole bunch of soil. So again, you just put the Vivian Romaine lettuce in and that's gonna do really, really wonderful in these. Let's move on to some herbs. In this case, I have long-standing cilantro here. Now you might be wondering, cilantro, that's something they usually like to eat in the summertime. But the deal with cilantro is that it's kind of a tricky plant. It doesn't like the heat. So growing cilantro is actually done best in the colder parts of the year. Right now I have two rotations of cilantro over there in my herb bed, and one of them is starting to bolt, the other one's starting to size up which means that it's time to now start the next one. So having it in a consistent staple, or as a consistent staple, is really ideal. And growing it in the colder months is going to reduce or eliminate entirely the chances of your cilantro bolting, which is gonna make you sad. So definitely recommend just doing it this way. Now next up we have chamomile. This is the German chamomile. This chamomile is really delicious. Now if you drink chamomile tea, I think most people have probably had a cup of chamomile in their lifetime at some point. Wow, these are some tiny seeds. Now, the thing that's different about fresh chamomile is that it's very fragrant. It has almost these kind of apple like notes. It has a very wonderful, sweet aroma. It's almost intoxicating to have just in the garden to smell alone, let alone to actually drink the tea from it. It just tastes like an entirely different thing. It's almost akin to buying uh, tomatoes at the grocery store versus growing them yourself. The chamomile that you get fresh out of your garden is just on another level, guys. It's so easy to grow. Now, coming up next is something that, I don't know why I've never really grown before. I have no good reason for it, um, and it's spinach. In this case, it's Oceanside spinach, which Oceanside is here in San Diego, so I'm definitely happy to see something like that that sounds familiar. Now, if you don't know, spinach is one of those plants that is daylight sensitive. What that means is that 
If you grow it at the wrong time of year, it's going to bolt no matter what. Once it gets a certain amount of daylight hours, it's simply not gonna do anything else except produce a flower stock. So this is something you wanna grow really in the earlier months of the year, like where you have less sunlight. And again, this is one of those things where I think one of the reasons I haven't grown it before is like I've grown a six cell and I put six spinach plants out, but you don't actually get that much spinach from a single plant. So in this case, I'm really happy to make use of these 16 cells once again and get a nice 16 pack of spinach so that when I plant it out, I'll have a proper block that I could actually harvest for a full meal. Because if anyone's cooked spinach before, they know that you could get that giant bag from the grocery store, dump it all in the pan, and it's gonna cook down to like a quarter cup. So when it comes to spinach, more is always better. And so here we go. I'm gonna go in with 16, and maybe this will be the year that I actually eat some spinach. All right, we're moving into some more flowers here. Some of these flowers are a little bit early, but here in San Diego, it doesn't, we're not gonna have any more frosts. We had two frosts, which is actually, I think, probably more than I'm used to here. The soil right behind me, literally in this bed, was frozen over on the surface. When I say frozen over, I should really say frosted over. It's not like it was a sheet of ice, but you could pick up clods of frozen dirt quite easily. So let's just say the nasturtiums didn't make it. So anyway, what I'm going in with right now is a new marigold to me. It's the Kilimanjaro White. This is just looks really cool to me. I've never grown a white marigold, and I love trying new things like that. So. I'm not going to put too many. I'm actually going to go ahead and just do um, two cells because I'm going to be putting in a lot of flowers here today. So I want to make sure that I'm not overloading myself too early. And speaking of nasturtiums, that's going to be one of the ones that we put in next. Again, I'm only going to put in a few because we have a lot of nasturtiums here. We are collectors of nasturtium seeds. So this is a new one actually to me. I've never grown it before. It's called Peach Melba. And I'm a sucker for peachy colors. I don't know why, I think it's because it reminds me of the sunsets that we get here. So anything that has peach in the name, I'm probably gonna try growing. So here we go with this peachy melba nasturtium. Now, like I said, they did die over there in the frost, but in other areas of the garden, they're doing just fine and they're actually starting to flower. So to me, that's the signal that it's definitely time to start getting them in the ground. Now, next one, again, we're gonna only do two of is the Bright Lights Cosmos. I've become a fan of Cosmos. I used to, I don't know why, I just never grew them that much, but I've come to appreciate them. I like how wispy the foliage is, it tends to not look as sort of dominating in the area. It has these like whimsical, tall stalks of flowers, and they're just really a lot of fun. Now this is an interesting one because it has blends of some of my favorite hues of colors when it comes to flowers, those reds, those oranges kind of, I guess, in that peachy sense again. So definitely something I'm interested in growing. And they're very good for pollinators as well. Now they do best in the warmer times of the year, but actually it was just over at Kevin's house and he has a gigantic, uh, I don't remember which variety, but his Cosmo is like this big and it has like 30 blooms on it. So I was like, okay, well, I guess that means I should start my Cosmos now. This is a classic one. It's called Coreopsis Double Sunburst. It honestly looks a lot like a, um, like the flower itself, I should say, kind of looks like a zinnia. It has lots of petals, but it's actually a really wonderful pollinator. A lot of zinnias are okay pollinators, but this one is really quite wonderful and it's very carefree. This can be perennial somewhere like here. I actually had a patch over there that I don't actually remember what happened to it. But the cool thing about these is that they're very drought tolerant. They could take a beating and do just fine. They're also, um, Coreopsis can be a very um, common native plant depending on your region. So for me, again, that's easy win because I love native flowers and I love things that require a little bit of water. So there we go. Now this is a, another one of my favorites. This is a alyssum, but this is a new variety to me. In this case, I'm going to do three of them. The reason why I really like these six cells is that they're very easy to divide up into different units. So in this case, I divided those six into three different two cells. So that's three different plants, two cells each, which is really wonderful. If I want a whole six pack, of course, I just do a whole six pack, but I could also split it into two rows of three, like I'm gonna do right here. And in this case, I wanna get three little cells of these alyssums instead of doing a whole six pack. So it's just really flexible because you could just put your labels and pointing in the direction that you're sowing. It makes it very obvious as to what's going on. What I have next is this tall blend of bachelor buns. 
I really fell in love with bachelor buns when I had them in my pollinator patch here. And I think I had that tall variety because they were always reaching up to the sky, filling in really, really well. And I loved the mix of colors. In this case, I have a white, a pink, a kind of more magenta-y one, some blue, some purples, really wonderful mix. So these are pretty wall-sized seeds. So I'm gonna just go ahead and sprinkle them into my hand here. Actually look kind of cool, like a little Batman, uh, well, I'm not going to say it, but you know, <laughs> the thing you use for Batman. So I'm going to go ahead and put two per cell here, maybe three. Now, of course, even when they germinate, you can't really tell what the color is going to be until they flower. And that's going to be quite a ways away. So just sow as many as you can and you'll see what you get. Now, one thing that you might be wondering about is where are all the tomatoes? Where are all the peppers? Don't worry. I'm actually waiting on the tomatoes because we found that starting them in January, it's a little bit too early for our season, which might sound weird to you guys, because most of you do start them in January in colder regions. But as I mentioned earlier, spring can be a wild time here in San Diego. We also have the May, gray, June gloom, where we have just really cloudy, cool weather for the very early part of summer and also most of spring. So I don't want to start them too early because then they're going to just sit in cold, wet soil for too long and they're not going to thrive. But what I will start right now is a jewel eggplant. This is a little mini eggplant. I am going to be starting a lot of peppers probably this week as well because they take much longer to grow than a tomato. And actually, quick segue, I wanted to give you guys the update on the overwintered peppers that I dug out in a recent video. I put them in these five inch uh, pots that we have from again American Tray. You can get them on our website. I'll put a link below. They are the perfect size for overwintering peppers for potting up things. I'll probably end up growing my tomatoes and potting them up into this size before I plant them out in the garden because they give a lot of room for soil. And they have these little slits again for the pruning of the roots. So just two of the peppers that I overwintered here, they're looking really wonderful. What you'll notice is that they all have growth coming out and that's totally expected. When you're closer to the time of planting them out in the garden, what you wanna do is instead of having like six different sprouting areas or leaf areas right here, you wanna trim them off. So you wanna start removing some and leave just one or two dominant ones or else you're gonna end up with a very messy, bushy plant that's going to be hard to support. But let's get back to this eggplant. Now, eggplant is kind of a polarizing vegetable, it seems. Seems like a lot of people don't like it. But these little ones that are more elongated, kind of like the more Asian style eggplants, are really quite wonderful. They have a nice texture. They don't tend to be bitter at all. And you can eat the skin, which is quite nice. With these small ones, I'm really excited to be cooking them whole and using them to make like fun little dishes where maybe I stew them up with like some tomatoes and onions, garlic. And I think they're just gonna taste really wonderful. So the cool thing about these is again, they're very tiny. So this is a wonderful container variety. Now this is another one where it's probably a little bit too early for most anyone. This is the Emerald Delight Zucchini. This is by far the best standard, actual true summer squash that I've had. You've heard me talk about the center cut a lot. That's technically not a summer squash. It is eaten as a summer squash, but it's technically a butternut squash that was bred to be eaten young. But this one, it's true. It's a proper summer squash. And man, oh man, is this thing not only delicious, really nice texture, really wonderful flavor. This is the one for us. It gets the job done, it tastes great, and it lasts all season long. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start two of these. I'm gonna, again, put this in the greenhouse, at least in a container for now. And then I'll definitely be sowing more of these in probably about a month or so to put them out in the garden proper. All right, we're back into some more flowers here. And actually, let's go ahead and swap trays. But we're gonna be starting some zinnias. Now zinnias are of course a summer staple flower, but they can do well at this time of year here. Once again, we got a helicopter. So I'm gonna get these sewed and we'll move on to the next one. All right, helicopter's gone and we could continue with a <laughs> very funny named marigold. This is called Naughty Marietta. Now the cool thing about this one, the reason why I got it is first of all, it's a French marigold. Now French marigolds are the best marigold if you're fighting root knot nematodes, which I definitely am, I'll tell you that much. I've been battling these guys now for a full year or so, and I am definitely gonna win. Anyway, French marigolds are better at repelling them than other marigolds, and they're actually proven to do quite well indeed, sometimes better than even conventional pesticides. Now, the other reason that I chose this one specifically is that it's compact. I made this only gonna get like this big, which makes it the perfect candidate to plant directly underneath your tomatoes in the garden to not only provide pollinators something to use, like those flowers, 
but also you still get that French marigold benefit from the roots of deterring nematodes away from your tomatoes. So I'm growing this now to test it out, see how it looks, see how it performs. Then come tomato season, I'm gonna be loading up my plants with all sorts of that naughty marietta. Now, let's go on with a tomato. Now, you might be saying, whoa, you just told me you weren't doing any tomatoes. Well, I'm doing a couple of different tomatoes, only bush tomatoes. And again, this is a, something that I'm going to be putting in the greenhouse. This first one is called Early Girl. I got it from Johnny's. It's an extremely well-known variety. I'm sure you guys have heard of it before. It's called Early Girl because it is an early season harvest or early season producer. If it says that it's early, as a general rule of thumb, you could assume that that does better in cold weather because it's designed to produce quicker for shorter seasons. So Early Girl Tomato, one of the few tomatoes I'm starting now. The other one is another bush style tomato, the Mountain Merit from Botanical Interest. This one will go in the greenhouse. It's just so we could have some nice tomatoes earlier in the season. The main crop won't be for quite a while now, but I do wanna get some slicing tomatoes on my sandwiches. This is the perfect size for that. If we get too many, we could always make sauce, but I don't know, this early in the season, I think I'm gonna be savoring and eating every single tomato that comes my way, so very excited about that. I'm gonna go ahead and we're only starting three each of both of these tomatoes. Spring is the time, as I mentioned, that many of you guys grow things like brassicas, and in this case, I have Caraflex. This is a new one from Botanical Interest. It has a very distinct shape, a cone head, you might say. And I've always wanted to grow one of these. I've seen these guys around uh, different names, different varieties. They're apparently really wonderful for making sauerkraut. I got a couple seeds here, definitely gonna start them. And there we go. Now, if you live somewhere like this, the just in case that I'm referring to is the just in case it gets hot, just in case it stays cold. You wanna cover your bases. You're not gonna have success in everything you do in the garden. So if you know that you're coming into a spring season where you don't know if it's gonna be hot or cold, try planting a little bit of both things, things that do well in the heat, things that do well in the colder weather, and that way you'll guarantee your success. Now this past season was a very cool summer. So I decided, okay, it's a very cool summer. I don't think it's gonna get very hot <laughs> anymore. We're already deep into the end of summer here. So I decided to start a bunch of brassicas, build my garden, and we have not bought vegetables from the grocery store throughout the entire winter. Now it looks like that was my last seed here. Definitely have a lot more seeds starting to do this season now. But I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you guys learned something along the way. I am interested in maybe making a full, all the tomatoes I'm growing, all the peppers I'm growing video. So definitely let me know if you're interested in that. And if you wanna know about starting seeds and keeping them outside, I'd also love to hear that because I am thinking about making that video. I don't know if a lot of you guys like starting seeds outdoors instead of doing them inside. I have a couple strategies that I developed along the years. Of course, now I have this wonderful greenhouse that helps me out a lot, but I still love the idea of doing everything outside in a low tech way. So let me know in the comments if you guys would like to see these. I'm gonna get these watered up and throw them in the greenhouse.